this week on World Stories. An insecticide and dead bees in Romania. A courageous stand against Christian terror in Uganda. But we start with a man who's concerned about the consequences of the recent elections in Germany due to the arrival of the radical right-wing AFD party in Parliament. As a Holocaust survivor, he finds it unbearable. The fascism Fascism in Germany never went away. It just took on a new form. We will hound this government. We will hunt down Chancellor Merkel or whomever else we need to. We will take back our country and our people. What does he want then? The borders from 1939 again? Yeah. Horst Zellbiger clearly remembers the beginning of Nazi rule in Germany. At school in Berlin, he was verbally abused and beaten up by his classmates. It started with them calling me horrible names like smart aleck Jew or Jewish pig. It got worse and worse, more offensive and then deadly. Sixty-one members of Zellbiger's extended family were murdered in the Holocaust. Fascism and Germany's coming to terms with its Nazi past are core issues in his life. And after seeing so much in his 90 years, he's horrified by Sunday's German election result. He's been sharing his reactions online. To be honest, I don't understand the astonishment and anger that the AFD has made it into Parliament. Nazis have been in Parliament since 1949. They had Nazi ministers. One was even Chancellor. Kurt Georg Kiesinger was Chancellor from 1966 to 69. Former Nazi party members held seats in the West German parliament until the 1980s, across most of the political spectrum. Horst Zellbega sees the rise of the AFD as a continuation of this tradition. I hope that really an Umdenken stattfindet. I just hope that a real change of thinking happens here and that this long-standing refusal to take the far right seriously will finally be confronted. We have to expose this ugly extremism and I hope this confrontation will play out in the new German parliament. I don't want to see the AFD take over. On the contrary. In Romania, beekeepers are facing disaster. Bee colonies there are dying off. They say the use of a long-band insecticide is behind it. Millions of bees used to buzz around here collecting nectar. But two years ago, all the buzzing activity around beekeeper Costel Groschala fell silent. Take a look. All the bees are dead. All because of this chemical they sprayed on the fields. My entire business is destroyed. At some point, I'll have to burn down everything. In the spring of 2015, wheat fields here were sprayed with the insecticide fiprosid, which contains the chemical fipronil, known for killing ticks. Its use near domestic animals was already banned at that time. Grishala says that people in the village of Puyest, in one of eastern Romania's poorest regions, weren't even informed. It was a disaster for us beekeepers. We were robbed of our livelihood. A beekeeper can't exist without bees. These gentlemen caused an ecological disaster here. They didn't think about the people or the animals or even about us. All they're interested in is money. 
and they can't get enough of it. Grishala lost 24 beehives and with them his livelihood. The same happened to other beekeepers. Along with farming, honey was one of the few sources of income for people in Puyest. The beekeepers are suing this man, exterminator Konstantin Treguts, for using banned chemicals. He sprayed the fiprosid, and now he presents it to us with a clear conscience. He no longer sells it, but he does still sell similar agents. The evidence shows that I'm innocent. Everything was signed and permitted. I was supposed to exterminate ticks. They live in the fields, not on airplanes or ships, so that's where I sprayed. I'm not to blame. The beekeepers disagree. Contaminated eggs in Belgium and Holland have focused attention on dangers of the insecticide fiprosid, which contains the dangerous chemical fipronil. The beekeepers want to put pressure on the manufacturer who is located in Bucharest. The company ignored interview requests, but this invoice shows that it delivered fiprosid to animal breeders. Slowly but surely, nature seems to be recovering. Costel Grishala makes a discovery. Wild bees have moved into one of his hives. That encourages him to begin keeping bees again, but it will be a long time before he can once again make a living from it. For years, a civil war between a Christian terrorist group and government forces has been raging in Uganda. One brave man is trying to heal the victim's wounds. St. Joseph's Hospital in Kitgum, northern Uganda. Here, some 200 patients are receiving treatment of the wounds they sustained during the Lord's Resistance Army insurgency. Millions were massacred, mutilated, tortured, enslaved and raped in the conflict between the LRA and government troops. Victor Achin and his organization African Youth Initiative Network provide support for victims who until now have never seen a doctor, such as Omara James. Omara James was abducted from Abia and he spent about seven months in captivity. So while he was in captivity, he would be made to walk long distance. But then as a process of torture, the, the rebel kept on piercing his leg with the bayonet. I have no problem with forgiving those who injured me as long as I'm healed. It depends on my ability to become normal again. That defines whether or not I can forgive. Mm -hmm. Omara James will walk again. Victor uses these success stories to convince the UN and the European Union to fund his project. He grew up in the midst of the violence and later worked as a journalist and reported from the conflict zone. Ten years ago, Victor quit his radio job to fully commit to his organization. Many victims have not forgotten what happened to them. How can you make peace tangible to people who have suffered injustice? And that's why we say heal people physical injuries, help them heal emotionally. It will open the space for historical dialogue a difficult dialogue, the dialogue that might be going through layers and unveiling many untold painful stories. In 2015, Victor was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Since then, he has turned down prestigious job offers abroad because he knows that Uganda's wounds are still a long way from being healed. Our last report is about a machine that's facing extinction. It's only still used in a few countries, such as India. It's the typewriter. The sound of a long forgotten era. Outside a local court in Delhi, street typists still earn a living from a machine that's obsolete in most parts of the world. Raj Bala has been working at this exact spot since 1988, punching out affidavits, sales contracts, rent agreements, and other legal documents on her second-hand machine. 
she makes about five to six dollars a day, just enough to make ends meet. Manual typing. Manual typewriters are really heavy. They can't get damaged. We don't have to worry about electricity failures. We don't need a printer or cables. All we need is a machine and a table. That's it. Rajpala says typing is the only work she's ever trained for, and she's not giving it up anytime soon. I love this typewriter like my own child. It's my only source of income. I'll continue typing till the very end. But the end has arrived for this iconic machine, and typing has also become a dying skill. As India pushes to modernize and digitize its economy, there are ever fewer takers for the antiquated technology. 80 typewriter stacked upside down. As a result, corner. shops like Rajesh Palta's are on the decline. His family has been selling typewriters since the 1930s in Delhi. Faced with stiff competition from computers, Palta has been forced to reinvent his business, restoring antique typewriters like these. Quite some time I was feeling depressed and I was actually seeing the end of the trade. But as most of the uh, dealers dealing in typewriters packed up, somehow I remained uh, because of my passion and that is making some business sense. The typewriter may just survive in the hands of skilled repairmen, giving the old machines a much needed tune-up, perhaps destined for a collector's shelf or as an exhibit in a museum.